Let's go to God. Thank you, God, for this group and for their time together. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come to your word, uh, to explore, to listen, to learn, and to, um, and to be challenged and to be encouraged. Uh, be with all of these that we have listed today and uh, remind them that, and let them know of your love. Uh, be with uh, Sarah and Mac and others who, uh, and Linda who couldn't be here today uh, too. And, um, and uh, we pray that you will guide us through your word, illuminate uh, your word for us, uh, shed light on your word uh, so that we might see it uh, clearly. In this we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May I make one announcement? Oh, please. Last week, friend sent me an email that said, you know, Fran and Dan and I are passing COVID back and forth. Maybe we should put Tuesday night Sunday school on the shelf for a while. Yeah. But yesterday I got a text from her, I mean an email from her, email from her that said, we're looking forward to seeing everybody tomorrow night. Tomorrow. Tonight. 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 So Tuesday night Sunday school, Sunday school is on tonight. If anybody is going to be inside gotcha. that Tuesday start. Gotcha. But uh, at Fran and Dan, so anybody interested in coming to right. study the Synoptic Gospels? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay, good, good announcement. And we hope uh, if they, um, it depends on how they're feeling, you know, day to day, day uh, but we'd love to have them uh, and, and enjoy their presence here when, uh, when uh, that works out too. Um, so we are going to study Acts 8, 26 through 39. Uh, today and uh, to get us started, uh, I guess my big goal is kind of tacky in the TV break. So um, you know, I'll just own it. I just it's diving out to do, and I, I need the caffeine. Um, all right, let's hear the word of God. <laughs> on to better, on to higher things here. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, "Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza." This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Egyptians, Ethiopian, excuse me, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before his shear, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the news about Jesus, and the, oh, excuse me, and, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, this is going to be the first of four on Christian mission, uh, the, uh, which is essentially making disciples. And we're going to, in this one, look at how a disciple was made in this situation and what was unique about it and what we can apply it and how it can be, uh, there are parallels in our day and time. And we'll do that with the next ones too. Uh, just kind of freshening ourselves up on making disciples. We use that word and it's kind of, and it's, it's important and helpful, but what do we mean and, and, and that kind of thing. So that's what we're going to be thinking about. Think about how... The Holy Spirit descended on the apostles in Acts 2, you know, so at uh, the day of Pentecost, right? And that, at that, from that point forward, the work of the Spirit starts in Jerusalem, and then uh, with healings and confrontations with the authorities. So if you'll look 
if you'll, you know, kind of keep your thumb in our passage for today, but look back at, uh, hey, all right, um, look back at Acts 3 through 5. 2. 3. So in Acts 2, they have the Pentecost event. Acts 3 um, through 5, we have, um, we have this, uh, this stuff happening here. And we're not going to read all this, but if you have the kind of Bible that has like headings, do you have that kind that has little yeah. subheadings? Notice how um, the Spirit is working with al alternating healings and confrontations with the temple authorities. Again, alternating healings and confrontations with the with with the temple authorities. Okay, what it, like for example, what is what do you see at the, uh, what does some of your headings say for chapter 3? Hey, one that says Peter heals, the Peter heals the court of beggar, and the next time you're speaking to the onlookers. Right, right, speaking to onlookers. And then in 4, what do y'all have? The arrest and release of Peter. I'm sorry? Arrest and release of Peter and John. Right, Peter and John are put before the council. They're pressed and released. They're, they're in trouble, right? And then... Uh, then we have a few things that happen in the rest of four, and then in, in five, uh, Ananias and Sapphira is a real unusual story. But then in five, the apostles heal many. At around verse 12, the apostles start healing many more people. And then what happens in 17? What is your heading at, 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 at chapter apostles, five? Apostles are first persecuted. They're being persecuted. Okay, so they're healing, and then they go to the council. Then they go out healing, then they get persecuted. Then in chapter 6, uh, starting around verse 8, uh, Steve, they decide to go out, the, the persecutors, the, the uh, religious authorities, decide, the temple authorities, decide to go after somebody. They've, they've crucified Jesus. Now they're going to go after the apostles and the followers. So who, are they, who do they go after starting in Stephen? And then he, he goes up and makes a speech in chapter eight, in chapter seven, but they still stone him by the end of the chapter. So then um, we get this little bit at the beginning of chapter eight about Saul going around persecuting the Christians. And then uh, we, you know, Acts is going to come back to him later, as you can understand. In fact, in chapter 9, after our text, he, he's converted. But in the meantime, starting at, at, chapter, at, at chapter 8, verse 4, the focus switches to Philip. And we, now Philip, um, you know, we, we just, we don't know any special things about him. I mean, he, um, uh, we presume this is probably the brother of Andrew. So this is probably the Philip that's one of the twelve, the main twelve. I mean, it's not told, you know, for sure, but that's the that's the operating assumption. So uh, he's he's uh, been in there with with Peter and James and John and all the rest, and this brother Andrew, and he's been following Jesus for three years, and, and you know, crucifixion and resurrection. And Jesus appears to him. But what do you notice has happened at the... What's the first thing it says about uh, the, the, the followers um, in verse 4? Could somebody read chapter 8, verse 4? I will. Okay. And those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Uh, Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed... Christ there. Okay. But when the crowds heard Philip and saw the, and saw the, 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 the miraculous signs he did, uh, uh, they, all played, they all paid close attention to what he said. It, it, it shrieks, evil spirits that came out of, of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Cool, cool. Okay, thanks. So Philip, now the first thing to notice is they're scattered. Verse, in verse 4. Okay, they were all together. 
at Pentecost. Then they went around in, Jeru in the Jerusalem area and, and in Judea. So they went around in their home area. And they kept, get they, they kept getting persecuted. Uh, and then one of them was martyred. So they, and now Saul, we're warned about Saul's going around kicking up a bunch of this stuff, and he's part of this stuff. And so they scatter. Now when they scatter, why do you think they scatter? I mean, afraid of being associated or persecuted themselves. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, they didn't want to be next. Um, but what happens, and Philip, and so all of a sudden, uh, Luke, who writes Acts, uh, we're pretty sure, um, tell, starts telling us about one of them. So they're scattered, but, but he focuses in on Philip. Because Philip goes through some um, interesting things. He goes to Samaria. Now, wait a minute. What's the, what's the, what do we know about Samaria? That's where the Samaritans are from. That's, that's a little bit outside hometown. That's a little ways. That's like going uh, up to Raleigh. <laughs> yeah, it's the bridge. I'm, cr I'm just crossing the bridge. To the <laughs> Sorry, Moorhead people. That's right. Um, he's gone up over into, the, into, the, into those areas, but people are listening and all this kind of thing. Um, in the rest of the chapter, there we don't have to read all that. But there's a uh, uh, magician and he uh, named Simon, uh, and he. They, they kind of go toe-to-toe -to -toe about things. And then um, the apostles in Jerusalem here in verse 14 that the Sumerians had accepted the word of God and they sent Peter and John over there so to kind of back up Philip. Um, and there's all this kind of great stuff going on here. Okay, so that's, what, that's the context. And in verse 25, it says, Now after Peter and John had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem proclaiming the good news to many villages of the Samaritans. So remember how the gospel was going to go out from J Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's what Jesus said. And um, so, so, you know, it's already gone to Jerusalem, Judea, and now it's going to Samaria. I mean, just like he said. And, uh, but Ethiopia is a long way from Samaria in this whole area. I mean, this is the same Ethiopia. Oh, is it the same place it is now? Today, yeah. Yeah. This is the oldest Ethiopia. Now, this guy, uh, who all, you never get his name, we're just told that he's a eunuch. And <laughs> Emily asked me, well, we were watching a uh, something and she's and the word came up and she said, Daddy, what's a eunuch? And I was like, I'll, what are you with her? And, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll just tell y'all, Google it if you don't know, and uh, I'm not responsible for what comes up. No, I'm sure the I'm sure the Wikipedia page, you know, tells you. So, but everybody knows that he's and he's a uh, let's just say an odd fellow out. You know, right? Is that a good, fair thing to say? He's he's just the, the, a eunuch. But because of his oddity, he wasn't allowed into the temple. So there, so there we go. So what we got to we got to be detectives here um, and ask ourselves questions we wouldn't that we just kind of read it that you might not have asked yourself when you when you first heard it. Okay, what for example? What in the world is an Ethiopian eunuch doing in Jerusalem? Apparently he was attracted to or either or a Jew. Exactly. And there actually have been Ethi Jewish, a Jewish presence in Ethiopia. Uh, many of some of them had fled to Ethiopia to you know, escape um, persecution or uh, to live out there and make a living, and there were Jews in Ethiopia. But this, but the temple is in Jerusalem, and what's a Jew supposed to do? Go make a pilgrimage to the temple at the festivals. Everybody, all the everybody showed up in Jerusalem. What three times a year? So he's apparently gone up for one of the festivals. Now he's going toward the south to the road that goes down to from Jerusalem to Gaza. 
that's still the Gaza Strip, right? And he's going um, on this road. And what else can we? What now? So we know he is he is actually a Jew. Now that makes him a bit odd. He's odd because he's a eunuch. He's odd because he's an Ethiopian. He's odd because he is a Jew in Ethiopia. So he's also odd that he's a Jew, Ethiopian, and very high up in the court. And that's the other thing. He's high up. What did it say about him? He's, he's a court in charge, charge, he's in charge of all the money. In charge of the Queen's Treasury of Ethiopia. I mean, wow. You know, with, with all this uh, regalia on TV from the United Kingdom, you know, they have a Lord Chancellor of everything with a fancy hat and all that stuff. Um, it's it's pretty it's really wild. There was some group in Wales um, uh, as they were moving the Queen or something. They and the they have like a goat as their mascot, and this goat is like goes ahead of the band or something. So it was it was weird. <laughs> Just, you know, there's a this uh, there's all these things that people do, and and so anyway, this guy. So now, so now we've got several things about this guy. Now we can tell something about him. Is he uh, a Jerusalemite? No. Is he a Judean? No. Is he a Samaritan? No. But he's going to the ends of the earth. He's going to some, to Ethiopia. Now, um, he is. He's. But he's also a Jew. And he's being baptized. It's later when the first Gentile baptisms happen with Cornelius. So he's not, he's not that, we're not at that, that's going to be a future uh, lesson. Did I hear correctly that he was not allowed into the temple? Yeah, well, uh, did it say it or did we just, we just know that, right? I think it's one of those simplicity of laws. Yeah, it's implicit. In fact, but it is true that he would. Um, in fact, oh, I know. I know why. Leviticus twenty-one. You don't need to turn to this. I'll read it to you. Let me tell you what the law said. Who could go in the temple? Now, this this is kind of one of those parts where it's a little awkward now, but uh, to read. But it says, "Speak to Aaron and say, no one." Uh, this is about who can go in the temple and who can't go in the temple. No one of your offspring throughout their generations who has a blemish may approach may approach to offer the food of his God. For no one who has a blemish shall draw near. One who is blind or lame or one who has a mutilated face or a limb too long or one who has a broken foot or broken hand or a hunchback, or a dwarf, or a man with a blemish in his eyes, or an itching disease, or scabs, or crushed testicles. So I guess that's you know. No descendant of Aaron the priest who has a blemish shall come near to the Lord's offering by fire. Since he has a blemish, he shall not come near the all that. So like it or not, there was a, there was some you had to be kind of a prime specimen to go to go to into the temple. He's, he's obviously been ostracized by the people, yeah. and he's reading scripture that he doesn't understand. So, so that's why yeah. Philip here is is a real disciple. Is a real disciple, right? And this, and also the um, the eunuch is already warmed up because he's a Jew and he's already reading Isaiah. So, so it's not like the people we encounter who are just totally unchurched and have no sense of Jesus. You know, I mean, this is just somebody who's kind of, you know, kind of halfway, you know, half in, one foot in, one foot out. Yeah. Interesting contrast is these sound like the people who Jesus had reached out to. Absolutely, absolutely. All the folks who were banned from the temple, he was the one who wanted to heal, take care of, or or children for that matter. Children. I mean, Sunday, Sunday, you know, we um, we you know. You know, talk to us about um, how radical it was to welcome the children uh, you know, to his knee. So uh, they were they were not allowed in the temple. There wasn't like there wasn't children's church 
at the temple on that. Um, there was Jewish school. There, they went to a lot of school, but there wasn't children's church. So um, then he rejoices after being baptized, too. So we get a whole lot of um, context here. And we see about his geographical origin, his sexual condition. Um, Luke's story echoes part of the prophecy of Isaiah 56. Let me read that to you. Isaiah 56, 6 through 8 says, And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it, and hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Jesus quotes that when he goes in the temple, right? Thus says the Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel. I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. So I don't want to just sort of label the whole Jewish life and practice and all that as often a Leviticus, Leviticus passage. Because you also have prophets who are saying, you know, God, that God wants to open the gates and the doors and all that. And, and he does through Jesus. So here's an outsider who takes an interest in Philip's Jesus. And it's a signal to us that the good news about Jesus is meant for everyone. Um, Luke is going to keep showing us in our study as we go along that we that God keeps intending to redraw the boundaries. So first, the boundary was Jews. Then Isaiah says, "I'm going to, you know, call upon you're you're my people, but I'm going to call upon the people of the, the kingdoms of the world are going to stream to Jerusalem, and you know, and and, and God already starts this expansive vision. Then Jesus shows us an expansive vision by reaching out to the outcast and the sinners and all that kind of thing. And then the apostles pick up where he left off after they kind of sort their stuff together after Pentecost, right? Then, they, then they're under persecution for it, for doing this work. But God still, look at, isn't it, isn't it awesome? And just take a moment of inspiration here. Isn't it awesome to see God making a way when, when the people wanted to stop him? That, you know, people didn't want to hear about Jesus. And no matter Jews or Gentiles, what have you. Some people just didn't want to hear it. They didn't want the change. They didn't want to, they, didn't, they felt it was a challenge. But here goes the gospel. Isn't that like a boy says, describing me? I'd much rather be soft and comfortable and watch TV and read a book every night again. But sometimes, you know, when you are, I hate to use the word persecuted, that's not, that's not the right word, but when you're forced out of your comfort zone, yeah. and whether it's a down the block or mentally, physically, you go and you've got a message. Yeah. And so that's how the message, God used the persecution right. to scatter the message. Right. Oh, so yeah, that's, that's actually what... Um, some folks, some folks see in this is the scattering was uh, actually rather effective. When when we gather for church, we bait, and then we go and deploy out into the world. We're mirroring this very thing. Uh, that's why the the beginning is called the gathering, and then the ending, if you look at the little headers, is called the sending forth. Where the church gathered, and then where the church scattered. And so during the week, hey, you, you're not you're not disconnected. You can you can connect back in to me, to this, to to God anytime. You're you're not it's not the church disconnected and you know cut off, but it's the church deployed and scattered. And that's and that's what I mean, that's what you guys were in that, you know, in that time of mission work uh, for the conference and all and all of us in our ways of helping were the church um, scattered. So that's, yeah. So this is interesting work here. Um, Ethiopian Christians are, and so they're not, they didn't really end up coming under like the Catholic Church and then the Protestant Reformation and all that stuff. They're, they kind of were part of more of the Eastern Church. And though they never really totally split off from, 
from the from the Western Church, they are quick to remind Ethiopian and African North African Christians are quick to remind Western Christians who came who came through the Rome the, you know, the Roman Empire and all that kind of up into England and then back down. Um, they're quick to remind the Westerners that of this story that their Ethiopian was one of the first, one of the very first converts to the faith. And that Christianity in Ethiopia is some of the oldest Christianity in the world, right? So that's yeah, just just a something that's kind of cool. That makes you think kind of makes you think about like where the center of gravity is, you know, as to like, huh, you know. So um, interesting work in this Ethiopian eunuch then. Luke keeps our focus on the Spirit's work through Philip. Where, here's some places I saw the Spirit at work with Philip. Um, that in, in verse 26, an angel sends Philip on his first mission. An angel came to him and told him to go down and, and run, up, run into this guy. Then the, then the Spirit tells him to, in verse 29 to pull up alongside the man's chariot. And then the interpretation of Scripture comes uh, from the Spirit, as does the, the baptism, the inspiration to baptize. And then finally, in verse 39, the Lord's Spirit rather supernaturally takes Philip away and takes him off to uh, Azotus. And, quote, all the city, looking at verse 40, all the cities until he reached Caesarea. Now, if you know a little bit more about the geography, we don't know exactly. I don't think we can really pinpoint Azotus that well but these days. But it's going further out. And there's a bit of, like, I don't know, fantasy sci-fi going on here, right? I mean, Phil's just kind of whoosh. To, but, but, okay. I mean, weird, stranger things have happened in the Bible, right? So he is, um, he's sort of whooshed. To geographically to this far off area until he reaches Caesarea. So now, Caesarea, what does Caesarea sound like? Caesar. Caesar, right? It's right there. There were actually several Caesareas. And it was basically kind of like there's a lot of um, Washingtons, you know, <laughs> right? There's Washington, D.C., Washington State, the original Washington. They want you, don't call them little Washington, they're the original Washington. Uh, up here uh, near uh, near us, or up in, down in eastern North Carolina. So, um, the the Washingtons, all that kind of. But anyway, a Caesarea is a heavily Roman influenced area. I mean, this. So he's getting sent across geographical lines and social and ethnic lines. So what does that mean for us? Let me ask you, you know, you know, let me ask you, what does that mean for us as we kind of think about um, what God did in this story? What are some things you think about? Well, I think it challenges us mm -hmm. to, to listen to what's being said here. Yeah. You know, I've thought about, you mentioned all the way back to the Old Testament, you had the Jews that were, that were very carefully cloistered. Yeah. And part of that was to, to get, they were the one that believed in one God, so they sort of had to cloister themselves. They did. They were often being like, persecuted and the other nations around them, although right. to hear the Bible say it, it, uh, the, the, it was the Jews who wrote the scriptures, you know, so they always come off sounding like they had huge armies and stuff. They actually had a really small army and they right. were not a major power. And, and they were, you know, I mean, many times they strike with the cats, the gold right. and all that. Right. So, you know, this is just an extension. Like I said, I think it's a living book here. It, uh, yeah. it moves yeah. on. It does yeah. not stay in one place. Okay. If we have the ability, yeah. now we're challenged. Now they hear. We have the ability challenged. through communications, different communications that yeah. we've never had, you know, 50 years ago. So, yep. rather than reject it, we need to embrace it. This idea, yeah, this idea of going to you know, the odd fellows, you know, the odd ones out, you know, that's, that's pushing the boundaries for us. 
full of, where Jesus went to send them where they were uncomfortable, probably. Yes. And yes. that's where we probably need to be. Well, and in this case, the, as I said, the Spirit's like, go here, go there, go there. I mean, to, it, it might be rare. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but it might be rare in your experience to hear an audible voice of the Spirit say, or it might be even more rare that an angel of the Lord has appeared to you, but some, it has happened that you know, people talk of, of these things or in their dreams or something like that. And um, But how do you sometimes hear the Spirit send you? you know, maybe more of a small, a still small voice or, or a stirring. The prophets would... Uh, Jeremiah or Isaiah talked about it burning in his bones. That's Jeremiah. But anyway, um, I'm burning in my bones. You know, um, you just can't get it off your mind. You know, you've got, and maybe it's one person, or maybe it's a an effort, a combined effort with other people. But you might have that person. Um, some of you have talked to me about that you have a lot of friends, you know, and that are in different places spiritually. And um, there's some, a lot of friends in the church, but I mean, outside the church, or in the church, but maybe not, maybe outside the church, you have friends that are in different places, and they don't really get why you kind of keep doing this Christian thing. Uh, and um, that's we're in a world where that's kind of the norm now. That it used to be, uh, if if you miss church on Sunday. Then when you went to work on Monday, people said at work said, we missed you at church. But now, if you go to church on Sunday and you go to work on Monday and mention, now this is not true, maybe uh, not true a generation or so ago, but I know in my generation and younger, if you if they mention that they went to church, the their coworkers go, you go to church? Exactly. And then there's like a, a weird stigma about you, and you're the odd, you're the odd person out. So it's it it's a it's a real different world, but the same principles still apply. You know, the same things still apply. That that God sends us sends us out. Yeah, Lee. I was sitting here thinking while we were going through this, um, the scattering part of it is kind of like COVID. There was a bit of, yes, um, yes. You don't have to go beat somebody on the head. You just kind of got to go pass by them a little bit and let them see who you are and keep on going and you might infect somebody. Right. Yeah. It's sure to take over changed. the world. Yeah. So. Yeah, our interactions change. So <clears throat> let's go infect some folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Taylor. Oh, uh, one second. Uh, yeah, I'll take a second. I think that uh, in these days, the disciples had a wonderful communication with God. And that's one thing that I think all of us need to work on all the time is that actual communication. Mm -hmm. yeah. How's your antenna, right? <laughs> yes, Diane. I was cleaning out my emails. And the latest one I had at the bottom of my inbox was your email was Mother's Sermon. Yes. And I hadn't listened to it. I hadn't been able to listen to it. Oh, what the heck, you know? So I found it, and I'm listening to it. First, I didn't recognize her voice at all. But her message yeah. prepared my heart, because that was my mama talking to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, after, mm -hmm. what, 10 years now? She was talking to me, and what she was saying in 78 preaches just as well in mm -hmm. 2022. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I was asked a question, I had to say yes because my mama was in my heart. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. You say no. Her, her mom. You don't say no to Team Mama. Some of, some of <laughs> Team Mama, and some of y'all knew Team Mama. Oh, she yeah. was uh, Cindy Roberts, and uh, those of you who didn't, um, she was um, very active at First Moorhead City, uh, First Methodist Moorhead, and uh, very active in women's rights. And uh, she was the State. She was the chair of the state delegation to uh, uh, push for the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment in the 70s. So, um, 
but she, the occasion of preaching was at Duke Chapel. Uh, she was invited uh, to preach at Duke Chapel, and there's they have on their website recordings going all the way back to the 60s or something of, of the different preachers. And when I came across Tibby Roberts, you know, one time on a, on a, on a, when I was searching for something, I thought, oh my goodness, Tibby Roberts, uh, preach at Duke Chapel, I've got to send this to Diane. They've got the recording right there. So, she sat beside me on the plane all the way to Israel and back. She was my oh, in the seat next to me, and on the whole trip that we were in, she was amazing, amazing woman. You know, that's great. <laughs> I was that's blessed awesome. by having her as a, you know, person sitting next to me on the plane for thirteen hours. <laughs> so, <laughs> totally, totally. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well. So to keep looking at our time, I want to uh, kind of tie this in a little, a little bit. So modern day parallels is what we're talking about. We're not likely to encounter someone who fits this exact description. I don't know if you've ever met an Ethiopian eunuch, but I haven't. Okay. <laughs> All right. But we use our imaginations, as we were just doing, to think about our society and the people who are maybe made to feel like uh, the odd person out. Yeah. And there are, we're all the odd person out, if, if we're honest with it. We just, we just all kind of conform enough to, that we don't stand out that much, right? But, but there are, there are people, you know, folks that are, that are the odd person out, that are a little different. Everybody's different. Um, and where are, those people found sometimes, I, I wonder. John Wesley and George Whitfield and other leaders of the Methodist movement looked around at the church in the, in the 18th century in England, and they saw an institution that they were raised up in and loved, but they saw it and, it, and saw that it was really serving the land-owning gentry, that it was really serving a certain fraction of the population. And so they... Um, were concerned about this, and so they took to open air preaching, which is was just not really done. Now they didn't, I don't think they were always now George Whitfield would, but they would they didn't just get up on a soapbox and, and yell at people. They would they would publicize some pamphlets around that you could come to the park and hear John Wesley preach or something like that, right? So they went, but they would go also. Outside of the religious centers, they all the way go out to the brickyards and the labor and the and the slums essentially, and preach there to people who would not <coughs> picture themselves darkening the door of a church of one of these fancy uh, English churches. So that's you know that's in each community where I've been a pastor, there's been um, and then there's been some anxiety. Every, every church I've been a pastor, there's always in the community a, a local, uh, hipper, younger church. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> there's always some up some church down the street, or around the corner, or around the block <laughs> that is you know that has the lights and the and the band and the thing. And I you know, I don't have a problem with that. I I've done. Participate in some contemporary worship and that kind of thing. I don't, in and of itself, I don't have a problem with that. What I do see is a problem is the people at the more traditional mainline church really worry and wring their hands about who is going to go from their church over to the new cooler, uh, you know, hot church uh, around the corner. You know? And I understand that, but. But I, I then want to reframe the question and say, and I do say to them, you know, I'm a little more concerned that, hey, if they go over there, if they're going to church, there's a lot more people, a whole lot more people, who aren't even coming to any church at all. So I'm going to refocus, I want to focus on, on people who are not even in, not even hearing the Word of God. Much like Wesley and Whitfield went out to the, Places. I mean, if I need to go out to the to different places, we'll do that. But you know, thinking about um, 
there are a lot more people who are not even in church than to worry about who went, who's left and gone to some other church. I can, I'm glad. I'm just glad they're going to church. I mean, you know what I mean? Don't. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna bring my hands about that. Um, uh, if 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 we're really reaching out and connecting with people who don't go to church, we're we're not gonna we're not gonna see we're not we're gonna have um, so much connection to people that it's not gonna really matter a lot. I mean, it's not, it's not, not gonna matter, but we're not gonna be bringing our hands about whether somebody found what they were looking for down there instead of over there or something like that. Uh, is it? Is there an amen to that? Am I? Amen. You, know you know what I'm saying? Am I preaching? Have I gone to preaching? All right. Okay. Supposed to. Supposed to. All right. So then, okay. So last bit. Philip then is a prototype for us. When we travel along life's highways, he was responsive to the Holy Spirit that sent him out. That's the that's the that's the first thing. I mean, if you don't do that, if you don't listen, if you don't have your antenna up, uh, it's got to start there, right? So so we so our if we have a take if we have one takeaway today, then and we just need to start at square one, or a person needs to start square one, just. Just be in the Word, be in Bible study, be, you know, worship, pray, and just put your antenna up and listen to God. Okay, then he was responsive. He didn't just hear it, he went, right? And when the Spirit, um, you know, he, might, he probably wondered, what can I say to this Ethiopian eunuch? You know, this, is, this was cross-cultural. But he... Can look at what a difference he made in the man's life. The man, he was already warmed up. He already wanted to know what this was. He already kind of opened the door for, to hear about Jesus. And then he saw the water and he opened the door to baptism. So this was, you know, this was um, a good first step on that. And that might help you too. Because sometimes we think, um, well, you know, I want I want others to know about Jesus. I love Jesus and all that. And but you know I I don't know how to start talking to somebody who doesn't know anything about Jesus or who doesn't want to be a Christian or doesn't want to follow Jesus or be bothered with that. And there's a stigma about talking about religion, you know, to people and that kind of thing. So this guy though was um, he was already kind of warmed up. I bet there's somebody in your life in your circles who's already warmed up, who's already got the door open, you know, who's going through something and and says, you know, I just don't know how you make it through hard times, you know, and then that's like, that's like opening the door for you to say, well, I have hard times and uh, God helps me through those. God helps me. I couldn't do it without God. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's the door got opened, you walked in. And you didn't threat, you know, you didn't make it about you. It just made about God helps me. Yeah. Yeah, I have a quick comment too. Um, kind of going off that, but also something you said earlier about how Philip was sent across social lines mm -hmm. and geographic lines. Mm -hmm. To me, what really stood out about that is that, I mean, we don't really get too much insight into his thought process, and so maybe he did kind of wonder, like, why am I being mm -hmm. sent here? Um, but I do feel like in other scenarios in the Bible, if there's ever any pushback, we kind of see that right mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. where Philip seems to just go wherever he's sent without any expectations and without right. without any, um, I guess, expectations about what the response is going to be. He just goes, okay, I'm going to go here, right. and these people that I'm talking to may not come from the same social background or geographic region as me, but even with the Ethiopian eunuch, he just waits almost to be invited and goes up and goes, what are you reading? Right. Like, do you really understand it? And he doesn't approach it in a way of trying to, right. you know, convince the Ethiopian, Ethiopian yeah. or something. It's, it's just a, a like, you just, know, what, what, right. tell me, do you really understand this? And mm -hmm. I just really, that stood out to me, like how much we can just in our own lives, you know, mm -hmm. reach out to people and preach the word in a way that's without any expectation from the other person and just yeah. telling our story because yeah. I think that's at the end of the day 
what we're meant to do. That's what we're meant to do. And people, uh, let's get an amen. 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 Right. And then, and then, uh, but and and people are really interested in hearing your hearing that that it, it piques their curiosity. You know, that's very few people are going to hear that you say, "Well, God helps me," and they go. Oh, don't talk to me about that. You know, if they're down and the, if they're downhearted and they're asking you what helps you, or they're looking for hope, you know, they're they're pretty. And but it's the fear of rejection that we're. It's just that old fear of rejection that all that, that gets in us, and, and we need to remember that the spirit of God is more powerful than our uh, than our than our fear of rejection. Spirit and that's like she said, you, you, the door, you said, open the door, you go in, and you give your witness. It can be from, obviously, yeah. all of us would have a different witness. Everybody would be different, everywhere. right? Yeah. And then it's God. Doing God it. takes it from there. Right. I mean, that's it. Right. God Turn takes it. Turn it over. I mean, that's. Yeah. And it's not your power, it's His. Yeah. So. God takes it from there. Right. And look what God did. He said, I mean, they passed by water, and and uh, the Ethiopian was like, "Hey, can I get baptized?" Now, um, uh, in an emergency, any Christian can baptize, <laughs> but um, but you know, you could send them to, you know, you could say, "Hey, we'd love to talk to you about baptism if you want to talk about that." Or, you know, you don't have to have an agenda. Maybe maybe all they just need is to pray. Maybe they have maybe that baptism isn't what. The Spirit is pushing them toward right there. Maybe what the Spirit's pushing them toward is to have the first prayer they've had since they were a kid. And, and you just lead them, you know, hey, well, you know, I'll show you how to pray. Just um, And you can do it like we do with children. Just say, hey, I'll, I'll pray uh, a little bit, a little line, and then you, if you feel it and, you know, you want to say it, then you say it after me. Uh, you'd, be, you'd be amazed how, many, how much somebody would feel it. That would totally change their, their, their heart. I was just going to say, um, it brought up something else the way Philip did this because, like Madeline said, he came up and said, what are you, what are you reading? And a mm -hmm. question is always a good place to start because then sure. you're like, I don't have, it's not like I have something you need to know. It's like, I'm interested in where you are. Sure. Like where you are first. Interested in the person, yes. And that. Yes. I have a hard time with that because I usually am just too pushy of myself. <laughs> but if I ask a question, it works so much better. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just ask a question and show interest in the other person. And genuine, authentic love, not um, a desire to, you know, mark one up for me. I got, you know, uh, I got me a disciple today. Uh, <laughs> just, 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 just offer, just being interested in it. Um, and, and so here's my little closer. Nothing is to prevent him from the baptism, but nothing is to prevent him from the love of God in Jesus. Not knowledge, not so he didn't have the knowledge he wanted, not ritualistic purity, he didn't have the purity that was required, uh, ability, ethnicity, basically nothing has, is keeping him from getting baptized. And uh, he's been pulled by the Spirit's tether and found knowledge of Jesus through the welcome that he received through Philip. Philip was just the well, just the ambassador, just the, you know, this Jesus's salvation for him. What a difference it would be in someone's life to be, um, to, to imagine and that, 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 that God is, uh, is interested in them. That's a, that, that's, that will blow their mind just to just to know that God is interested in them, and then God loves them. I mean, you you can you know that can change a person's whole world when they when they really hear that and think about that. So next week um, if we are crossing cultures and looking at Acts eleven um, one through eighteen, and if you. Uh, what, what, what that is basically, we're gonna we're gonna hear about how Peter went to the church in Jerusalem and defended how he baptized the Gentiles. So we're, so built into that is gonna be kind of a kind of kind of if you want to do the long the long read, 
read Acts 10 and 11 both, but I mean they're not that long, right? So, but we're gonna we're gonna our key text will be Acts 11 and 1 through 18. All right, any housekeeping? Anything else we need to do? We're good. We're gonna catch up our uh, brothers and sisters who were sick in a way today too. And wish them our best. And we're glad uh, to have Malin here as a new um, participant. And, um, and we understand your schedule. We will come as you're able. Uh, that's, that's great. Um, uh, and then uh, Diane and Lee just drove up from Florida yesterday. Long into the night and stuff. So. From and then south of Florida. South of Florida. And then got up and... Uh, Started was, early and didn't intend to go was, all day. Was, it, was, it, uh, <laughs> was it a little hard to get up this morning? No. Not at all. I don't know. Not too bad. All right. Well, good. That, all right. We're not talking about what's going to happen this afternoon when you crash. <laughs> yeah, you're going to crash. Yeah, you're going to crash this afternoon. All right, let's go forth. Uh, God bless us as we go forth into this uh, world and as we share uh, the love that you have shared with us, uh, and uh, help us to learn from all these things uh, good lessons for our uh, our work. Uh, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.